Dobar dan svima. Good afternoon to our audience in Bosnia and Herzegovina and a wider region. Good morning to some of our panelists from the East Coast USA. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Goran Barbir and it's a fine evening here in Wuxi, China, a small city of 7 million people near Shanghai, where I live and work as science teacher and coordinator at Nanwai King's College Wuxi, one of the top international schools here. Uh, originally, I come from Chaptina, and I'm very excited to host and moderate a discussion titled How to Get into the Top Universities in the World. Our goal today is to help you, parents, teachers, and students, to realize that you can be either having a similar story as our panelists, or that you can help achieve the same thing to somebody. Um, this is ha all happening on behalf of Bosnia and Herzegovina Futures Foundation. And in next part, I will short, shortly introduce our uh, mission and vision. So our goal is to transform Bosnia and Herzegovina into a prosperous nation that can respond to the challenges of the 21st century. By empowering the youth through education, technology, and leadership, we shape the next generation of change makers. By 2030, we will grow to a community of 10,000 change makers who strive for the advancement of quality of life in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Some of you are already part of it. Some of you who are listening today will be hopefully motivated to join. Um, now on to some details about today's discussion. Uh, this panel discussion will last 120 minutes and it will consist of two parts. 90 minutes will be the general discussion and it will start with introductions of our panelists. And last 30 minutes are, is going to be a Q&A session. This discussion goes live on YouTube and the audience is strongly encouraged to write questions or comments as the discussion goes on. It has to be noted that all the questions in our agenda are already crowdsourced via social networks and questionnaires. Uh, we will try our best to address audience questions during the discussion itself, but if that's not the case, there will be a plenty of time during Q&A session. Now we move on to introduction of our panelists and we'll start alphabetically with Ivana Devic. Ivana comes from Snegotina near, near Banja Luka and she is a teaching assistant and undergraduate, undergraduate research assistant at Dartmouth College. Ivana explores how engineering, science and mathematics can help solve the global energy crisis and move towards a more sustainable future for all. Ivana deeply cares about educating less privileged students and you can hear more on our Future Voices podcast when Ivana did a great job. Hello, Ivana. Hello, everyone. Greetings from cold but sunny Hanover. I'm happy to be here and I'm excited for all the opportunities this uh, panel is going to bring to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Ivana. Move on to Hanna Galiashevic, originally hailing from Velika Kladusha. Hanna is a junior double majoring in computer science and linguistics at Yale University where she also serves as academic strategies mentor and pedagogical partner. Hannah is passionate about learning how to bridge cultures and socioeconomic classes through technology, data, and language. While at high school, she was the coordinator for Asociacija Srednjoškola Atsa u BiH, Asabih. Hello, Hannah. Hi, everyone. Hope everyone's doing fine in this time. Uh, moving on to Nikola Jurkovic, who is an incoming freshman at Harvard University. He was a participant of European Physics Olympiad and Physics National Champion in Croatia. His main interests are engineering, physics, and effective altruism. Fun fact is that Nikola and myself are bro both proud alumni of Gimnasia Metković. Hi, Nikola. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. The last but not least part of our discussion is Munib Mesinovic. Uh, he is a Master of Science in Advanced Computer Science at University of Oxford. And he's the first and probably the only Bosnian Herzegovinian to be selected as Rhodes Scholar. For those unfamiliar, past recipients include astronomer Edwin Hubble and former American President Bill Clinton. Munib is passionate about tackling complex problems in multicultural environments with an emphasis on applying technological innovation to health and similar areas. Hello, Munib. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me and great to be here. Um, I'm in Travnik now in Bosnia, and it just snowed, so yeah, exciting. Great to hear. So to start, um, according to the recent World Bank report, 50% of youths in Bosnia and Herzegovina are unsatisfied with their secondary and post-secondary education. And more than 25% say that knowledge and skills they acquired are completely out of the line with the needs of the labor market. 
All that is contributing to the youth employment unemployment rate of almost 47% in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Given these facts and a similar situation in the entire wider region, how did this getting into the world's top universities even became a reality? When did that happen? What was the Eureka moment? Let's start with Nikola. Uh, yeah, so, well, ever since I was in elementary school, I've been deeply dissatisfied with the educational system in Croatia. And at one point I just uh, decided uh, to just do it myself. And then I started learning from the internet. And yeah, the internet was my, uh, was a very important source of education for me. And that also led me to, to apply to US colleges. So, yeah, I can go. Oh, Gorana, I think you said something, but you were muted. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, I thought to ask Ivana what was her uh, what is her opinion on this question? How did this became a reality for her? Um, yeah, I kind of had similar experiences. Nicola did. I was a lot like major bookworm child of the internet during my elementary school days, and I was exploring all the possibilities of like international education. And I think. The moment it kind of seemed more like realities when I read an article about like new um, um, international education program in Banja Luka, the IB, and I was like, oh my god, this is so close. This is, might be possible, and I think that was one of the like breakthrough moments for me. <clears throat> Can you give us more more details on IB program? Why was that maybe a key part of your why was that the stepping stone to get into where you are today oh yeah sorry um yeah it was uh different than the like national curriculum and offered more freedom and more like up-to-date knowledge we learned from like relatively modern textbooks and we were more focused on like critical thinking we had this like subject called theory of knowledge when we like learned how to apply um, different philosophies and just like explore subjects with more like critical sense rather than just like simply memorization and, co and copying. It also allowed me to like choose subjects. Like I was focusing more on math, physics and computer science instead of like having to learn something I don't even care about and I will probably never touch in my life again. For me, it was uh... The biggest help, I think, was seeing someone from my high school go to uh, university abroad, and specifically the one I went to, decided to go to. I think that was a really big sh kind of sign to say, oh, it is possible, you can do that. Um, and I think I agree with what Ivan and Nikola said, definitely the internet is like the biggest help you can have when applying and deciding how the process works. What I would say for me, the biggest decision factors deciding to apply was that I saw what university life was like in Bosnia and it wasn't interesting enough and not enough opportunities. I didn't know really what it was like studying abroad. I just knew it was probably different and that was enough for me to try. Um, and also uh, it's much more likely that if you do study abroad, there's um, financial aid, which might not happen when you study in Bosnia. So that was also another incentive. What about uh, reactions from, uh, from the environment, from family, from friends? like? How did you find encouragement or what was the source of motivation? Hannah, can you shed more light on this, please? Um, sure. So I think for me, I was mostly just like self-driven because um, no one from my high school had ever like applied. And I really thought, oh, like, you know, I can't make it. I, I don't have the credentials. The other people from Bosnia who like did make it to these places, um, I, I, did, I did not have those. Um, but I, I did find... Um, I, I like I randomly stumbled on an online course um, from Harvard um, on edX and I took it um, because I was bored in my high school and like I had too much time on my hands. Um, and I saw like what the lectures were like and what what you know the homeworks were like and what the environment is in, in a classroom like that. And I was just really fascinated by that and started kind of like looking more into it. I think like the biggest support 
I had was um, just like the internet community. Um, I, I do rem I do remember um, Ivana herself like being a big support because we were applying at the same time and we were part of this like same like scholarship fund. Um, so I, I did have like some people who had some experience with that. Um, uh, otherwise, like you know, I was supported by my family who kind of you know helped like you know drive me to the places I needed to go um, to to apply and all of these things. So um, yeah, I, I really just like everyone here wanted to kind of see what it was like not being in Bosnian education, which is like kind of sad, but yeah. Um, yeah, uh, also like Hannah was mostly self-driven because um, at first it seemed impossible to just like go to like a school in another city and let alone like to another country. And internet community was a big support. And some of my teachers that were, um, willing to assist in preparations for like math and science competitions and when it comes to reactions i don't think my parents were like actually thinking it's reality until i came to them and said like who's gonna drive me to get my visa and they're like what so it was it was rocky road but i'm glad that i made it through Oh, absolutely. Oh. My parents let me apply because they thought it was not going to happen. So they were just like, you do you, um, but you're going to college, you know, in X, Y, Z. In case to, 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 our, to our audience, that's like, in case that some of, uh, some of the people back home can't even comprehend how big is this? Like how many applicants all over the world are you competing with? Like, there's also something that we can only attribute to luck. Uh, how do you feel that luck was a factor there? Like, obviously, it would be lovely if we can say to that everybody can achieve what you did, but I'm sure you're also aware that uh, this route could have gone the other way at any possible moment. Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, uh, for me personally, there was a ton of luck involved. I mean, first it was finding the right resources, reading the right books, and then it was uh, getting into the universities. And I think that it's possible to, to, to pass some of this luck down to others. So I think it's, it's, it's good to, to find someone else who, who's been through it. And I mean, some of these universities have very low acceptance rates, like 5% like or 7% or something like that. But uh, if, if you keep statistics in mind, it, it, it's probably best to, to just apply to a ton of universities and then you might have some good chance. And I think um, I also talked to... Um admissions officers who process these applications and they really told me that in their experience one admissions officer can admit a student but if someone else had read it a different one they would not have so it really also depends who reads your application i think a lot of schools now do like a panel a panel reviews applications not just one admissions officer but that might not happen if it's like too many applications so yeah it is really luck based a lot of the time yeah, I mean, I think it goes to say that, like, I, I don't know about others here, but I applied to 12 colleges and like I definitely expected to get into none of them. Um, you kind of have to have like a plan B of like what happens if I don't get in, like if I do get in, like that's plan A, like awesome, let's go for that. But if if you don't, like you have to kind of have like contingency plans. So I, I was going to go to Slovenia to study and like I was already applying there. Um, but given that I got in before I had to submit everything, like it was just a subtle thing, but you do have to count on that. A couple of useful tips here already. So uh, the law of big numbers apply to as many as possible and have a backup plan, definitely. So let's move on to application process. What do you, what do you think is the best time to start? What are the first steps? Maybe start with Ivana. I think the best time to start is like junior year of high school because there are, especially if you're applying to US, there are a ton of tests you have to do and you just have to plan your studying for that and like how to manage that with your actual like school workout workload. And then um, just timing the um, applica actual applications because um, most of them are due in December of um, like, your senior year, so like your last year of high school. So by the, that time, you have to make sure you have like everything ready and um, also plans B, plan B as well. And just make sure what, what will you do if like 
if you want to take a test and it doesn't get the results you want, what are you going to do? Do you want to redo it? Or like, how do you finance that? There is a lot of logistics involved and it's really important to start planning ahead. Also, I think like Nicola should add a little bit more to this because he's the one who applied most recently. I like, I, I think a lot of things changed since we applied, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not a very good uh, authority on this because I did everything in the, in the last minute and that caused a lot of problems. But if I could go back in time, I would start uh, at the latest uh, during the end of my third year of high school. I would start researching everything, uh, writing down stuff on my calendar, writing down the deadlines, just so I don't miss anything. Uh, what about choosing your, your future, choosing the major? Like, How is it important to have a clear picture of that when you are in the third year of high school or you kind of have some luxury which is not familiar uh, back home where you basically have to choose immediately you enroll in something that you're going to study for three or five years and then move into jobs market are there any differences when you go and study abroad what about what do you think about that Munib I think really it's very different um, in most U.S. schools someone can fix me uh, if they know differently, but you don't really decide your major until much later in your freshman year or even your sophomore year, so that's your second year. Where I went, I went to a liberal arts college, so you would take a lot of different classes and different majors, and then you would decide even in the second semester of your second year what major you wanted to do. I did apply knowing what major I wanted to do, and I wrote about that in my personal statement, and I think it helps if it, if it fits with your narrative. Like, for example, like Nicola, he went to like physics and math competitions. So if he's going into a related field, that really shows a kind of progression and how much he invested in that. So that can help admissions officers know you're really passionate about something. But if, you, if you're not sure, that's also fine. As long as you can tell a story that why you want to go to that school, you can decide on the major later. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I'm someone who like changed her major in her sophomore year, or added another major. Um, so you you can do that. You can have two things. Um, if you have the time and if you have like you know the right plan, you you can you can work towards this. But I did come in like thinking I was going to study computer science and math and like statistics, data science, whatever. Um, I ended up only doing the computer science part um, for many different reasons. But I found like another passion through that whole liberal arts program where you get to choose basically every class you take like even within my major I just need a certain number of classes but that's it I think I think that's a lovely uh, option I wish I could change some of the things back in my sophomore year but I, I don't think that's a possibility in most of our universities uh, the whole process can be crazily expensive and there's a lot of tests and a lot of probably post fees to pay, how to save some money, how to make it as, as, as easy as possible in case obviously you, you fail, how to, how to kind of like reduce the, the losses. I can speak on that. Um, so I did, maybe Nicole can add later because he applied recently, but when I applied to college, I researched like which colleges do not need you to send something, which college you can waive application fee. I would like write little emails to the admissions office and be like, yo, I'm from poor country. This is a lot of money for me. Can you like give me other way to send this so I don't have to spend like $50 on this letter? And sometimes they were like, um, you could also find on the internet which schools are kind of like willing to do that, which schools are like very strict and like you must send the official SAT, end of story. So it involved a lot of time, but I think at that time, because I was living in Bosnia and not earning any money myself, like any significant money, it, it meant a lot. And I was, and I had quite some time on my hands to like sit down and write that just to not be a burden to myself or my parents. Yeah, uh, well, in, when it comes to US admissions, uh, when you're writing standardized tests, uh, there are some universities which require you to pay to, to send them official test results and there are some universities which will just uh, take, take your word for it and then if you're applied then you have to confirm it. So it's best to just write, write a mass email to, to every single university you're applying to asking them if you can just uh, send the unofficial 
uh, send an unofficial report. And in this way, I didn't have to send a single additional uh, test report. And when you're writing tests, mostly you get four free reports. And yeah, you, you, can, you can save a lot of money on that. And if you're applying through Common App, which probably you will be, um, there's a place where your principal or your counselor, depending on who you have in your school, can submit a letter. So you can type out the letter and they just sign it and you upload it into this tab for application fee waiver. And then Common App just gives you an automatic fee waiver. So you don't have to pay the application fee for the schools. So that's kind of independent from the schools themselves. Yeah, and more oh, yeah. on the saving money side, um, I, per I in particular had an opportunity to get a scholarship from uh, Education USA in Bosnia. Um, they have this program called um, God, Competitive Colleges Club, something like that. It's like three C's. Um, but it, they, they basically, if you manage to get the scholarship, um, it's called the Opportunity Fund, and it's like an international thing. The US like embassies pay for it. Um, all of the official parts of my application, even um, even like my travel reimbursements would, were made through that. So I very much like spent very, very little money because my scholarship covered basically everything. They, they covered 10 colleges and I applied to 12, so. Wow, those are those are great numbers and great tips here. Uh, really, I, I think there's a lot of research that you guys did to, to get this amount of knowledge. And I hope that our participants are getting some free tips here. Uh, the other question that I had is when I when I looked at your uh, biographies, all of you are uh, general education or uh, gymnasia students. And uh, I was just thinking, uh, does does that mean that gymnasia in our in our language gives a bit of better outlook than vocational schools. What is your experience with that? Uh, how does your high school choice, how did that impact your uh, chances on enrollment to these universities? Maybe start with Hannah. Sure, so um, I think it's like almost exactly like it is in Bosnia. Like um, it's really, I, I don't think it's possible to apply to college. I, I mean, like, I don't think they will, accept you to colleges if you only have a three-year um, high school education, at least in the States. Um, I don't think that's the case in Bosnia either, but someone correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but basically, if you have like a four-year high school education, like you should be fine to like logistically apply to things. Um, I will say that like having had a general, um, like I guess, grammar school, I, I went to uh, a gymnasia in, uh, in Velka Kladusha. It, it does prepare you like literally for this liberal arts studies thing. Um, it really just like, it, I came here and I really felt like I had kind of a solid foundation to start any subject I wanted. Like I could start linguistics because I had had like four years of like Bosinski as a kick news that covers all of the topics. So I went straight into um, all of these like advanced classes. I didn't even have to do the intros and like it happened for a lot of classes. Um, the Tricky part here is that you might be like spread out too thin. So in gymnasia, you might not be very prepared for like certain things unless you um, were planning to like go to all of these like, competitions and everything and did your own self-study. So I really was like ready to take on any subject, but it wasn't a master of any of those. So it's kind of tricky, but I do think like, I don't know, it definitely helped that I had had um, a gymnasium education but I don't think that's like detrimental I think that if you're self-driven enough and like you know if if you're doing everything you can to kind of give your give a best education to yourself like any kind of high school works and I think more generally what this touches upon is how how good you need to be at something or how smart you need to be to apply I really think that that what you need is a decent enough knowledge of English and then you can pre like prepare yourself for all the tests online. I really don't think you need to have a particular like excellent knowledge in math to go into a school to the US. I really don't think it's necessary. Um, and I also know that when you go to the US, you usually start from very fundamental classes. In engineering, you start with calculus. You might've done calculus in high school, but you start from calculus. So it doesn't, you, it doesn't really matter. You'll catch up either way. Yeah, and when it comes to high schools, I think uh, one one thing you could aim for in your high school is if it has many exchange programs or programs with schools in other countries or Erasmus or something like that, uh, that can really uh, it can uh, enrich your your high school experience and add to your application.
Yeah, um, adding to that, I think it's important to show that you're like something you're passionate about. I don't think like based on many of my friends who went to like vocational schools, I don't think they had many like extracurricular activities outside of their like school. And I think uh, general education sometimes offers more of like things you can pursue like math club, physics club, arts stuff, volunteering, which I think helped me a lot on my application. And also I agree with Hannah's point that um, it gives you a kind of a, a jump on credits, at least in my college, I could like, I started from all advanced math and physics classes because I already did them in high school. Thank you. Thank you very much for this feedback. Uh, now, the next part that we might talk about is obviously, yes, you, you applied, you went through, you, you had to do all this paperwork, but you obviously stood out during that process. You, Somebody somewhere said, these are the students that I want to see in my campus. How did you do that? What, what are the, are there maybe some general advantages for students from our region that maybe you have noticed? Uh, there's plenty to talk about here. What are your thoughts on this, Nicola? Sure. And uh, I've talked to a bunch of students from Croatia who are now studying in, in, in other countries and in the UK and, and in the US. And mo I, I'd say that most of them sit out uh, due to having one or two uh, things they were very passionate about, be it like physics co competitions or biology or chemistry or just some projects. Uh, and most of them actually use the internet to, to, to manifest that passion. They, they didn't have that much help from the outside. I think, yeah, I think uh, touching upon the, oh sorry Hannah go 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 oh it's uh, what, touching upon the region the regional thing I think um, a lot of schools are already used to students or have had someone from Bosnia apply and um, obviously Bosnia is a post-war country dealing with the transition process so a lot of personal statements might be influenced by that or might include those narratives and I don't think you should worry about it sounding like cliche as long as it's authentic, as long as it's relevant to who you are as a person and it defined your experience as a high school student, it's fine. Um, but I would also urge you not to make it the only thing you talk about. Make sure that you as a person can stand out as well, you. And how will you kind of impact that community and environment, not just how the environment impacted you, yeah. Absolutely, I think that as long as you, um... You know, as everyone mentioned, like are passionate about something and kind of make that shine. As long as you make sure that you're using all of the resources that you have at, at hand, um, even though they might be like far fewer resources than there are for other countries, um, as long as you're using all of the opportunities that you get um, and kind of show that in your application, you say, you know, I couldn't go further than this, but I did everything I could to get there. Um, that that's something that tells them that you're very passionate about, like you know, doing your best and and just really um, taking everything in. So don't be lazy, I guess. Yeah. Ivana, do you have anything to add? What was your yeah, X just, factor? Yeah, I just want to like confirm the Hana and Munib statements. I think what was like the luck factor for me is the fact that like did everything I could do in my high school and always like strive to get more opportunities and uh, which might result in me being a complete nerd in high school. But I think it showed them that I'm like very curious and persistent and willing to help both others and myself. And I try to express that as honestly as possible in the application. That's definitely great, great to know and great to hear. Um, obviously, a necessary part of every application is a letter of recommendation or a couple of them from your teachers. How to start that process? When and who to ask? Did you maybe wait for your teachers to, to kind of um, to give you feedback before or you, were, you have just been chasing them around? Muni, what, what, what's your take on here? So I asked several professors, teachers, I asked more than was necessary. And then, um, so I would have more time to figure out who would know me better. So 
I didn't know when I asked who would say yes, who would say no. So I asked as many people as possible. But um, it was, I think you should keep in mind that you should give them enough time to write the recommendation letter. Usually like at least, I think three weeks would be reasonable. Um, and you should also calculate that you might have to translate it to English and an official English translator. Um, yeah, I think those two are the most important things. Just ask the person you think knows you best from the teachers. They don't need to be your best friend. They just need to know you decently. You know? Yeah, and also it's very important to note that letters of recommendation for these schools are quite different from what your teachers might expect them to be. So, um, you know, other than the three weeks that you give them to write it, I think you should also take some time to introduce them to the concept of the letter of recommendation, which you will definitely learn about while you're learning about the application and what they should look like so that they don't, you know, kind of surprise you by just like listing out all of your extracurriculars, which is like everything you did already. So they need to um, provide kind of like a personal touch on that. And as, as, to like who you choose. I think that like that's a very personal thing, but some things you also have to take care of. So um, I when I was applying, I some schools required that I had one social st sciences teacher, um, one like quantitative reasoning, so STEM teacher, so I uh, and a counselor. So that was like the three minimum. And then you could add on to that. But they also discourage you from adding on too many because they might like be repetitive and like unnecessary and redundant. Yeah, I think great thing to add to that is that if you're having two recommendation letters from different teachers, kind of tell them to like, if you're good at science, don't make your, be explicit to your like humanities prof, do not tell you how you're good at math because that's someone else would probably cover and you want the application to kind of shine or all parts of yourself that, so basically to sell yourself in the best way. <laughs> What about, uh, what about some tips during that uh, process? What are maybe things you had to be careful while, while you were writing essays or doing live interviews? Uh, do you have to be obviously in line with those let letters of recommendation? How did you build that whole personality that recruiters or admission officers wanted to see? Uh, Nicola, what are your thoughts on this? Um, yeah. Uh, I when I was in high school, I read this amazing book. It's called uh, How to Be a High School Superstar. Uh, basically, it says, uh, it, uh, it, it talks about what admissions officer, officers actually want. And I, I can't really do the book justice to, to, to condense it in, in short. But yeah, basically, you should, you should be very focused on, on, on something that you're passionate about. It's not just uh, find something that you don't like and then do that. I mean, it's important that you that you find something that you like, that you spend a lot of time on it, that you have a bunch of free time to explore. And yeah, just in short, go read that book. Also, be honest. Like, don't at any point lie about anything about yourself. Um, they will know. They have ways of knowing um, and they have ways of figuring it out. Um, and it might seem like very structured to us but for them it's like you know these people have been doing this for decades like the admissions officers so they will know if you're like lying about something or like making something up so you know just be very honest about even your personality like they, they want to know what your personality is like and they want to know what you're like because you're going to be living with them for four years so yeah i think that's especially important in like if you're applying to u.s colleges because the admission is more holistic so they like want to see the whole package and like want to see if you fit in the social aspect of the college so do not be too concerned about like if your essay has to have like some like rigid structure it's good to be creative and just to let your I mean it sounds a bit cliche but let your personality shine and just try to structure everything so you present yourself in the best light possible. If, uh, if, nobody, if nobody has anything to add, then we can move on to the next part. The next part where I was kind of also super curious is something that parents here in China are very kind of like focused on. After school, you have to join so many clubs, you have to have so many competitions, you have to be able to play piano and so on. 
how what, what are your takes on this like what was the impact of extra curricular or uh, van astani activity uh, how important is that really um, ivana you can start with this one oh yeah i as someone who had many um extracurriculars during high school i think i can speak on this i think is the extracurriculars are very important but it's also important that there is like one or two you're really like devote a lot of time into that you like made some projects or make some significant impact because it's not a thing that you have like so many extracurriculars you're spread out through thin and you cannot really like take significant part in any of that it's important to just like focus on several things that you are passionate about and you're doing well and just like try to uh, play that point and display them on your application rather than trying to do everything because um, that's not how it works and it's going to lead to you being burned out and unhappy and you won't be doing well in school after that. Also your extracurriculars can be all sorts of things. They don't have to be the usual formulaic, oh, you know, I help with whatever, I don't know, sports. Uh, it, it can be really anything. I had a friend that wrote about how he helps his grandparents um, get groceries and that was his extracurricular activity um, so it really can be all sorts of things as long as you, you can show dedication to a community you can show how you're making an impact in someone's life I really feel like that's the key and what you learn from it, it that anything could really qualify as that yeah and I think it's important to know that you don't really have to think inside the the constraints that are imposed on you and if if there's some extracurricular that you would like to do, but it isn't available to you, you can also just start a club. You, you, can, you can create something new and that will be even more impressive to the, to the admissions committee. You just found a robotics club or something. But I think only if you care about it, like if you notice that um, you don't like a certain extracurricular activity, don't keep doing it just because you think it'll like, look good on your application because you will be miserable and it'll show on your application. Um, so really just, you know, if, if you don't like something, move on and find something else because it's much important, much more important to like have some kind of value to your life before you even apply because you may or may not get in there, but you are spending four years in high school and you might want to do that the way you like. I wish I wish somebody shared these tips with me when I was when I was in high school. Definitely, I agree with everything. So, in short, be honest, be share something that you're passionate about. Don't try to fake it. In this case, you probably won't make it. A lot of great tips. Thank you, guys. Uh, the next large part of discussion will be dealing with scholarships, as it's quite obvious that. A very a, a, a fraction of not only population here but a fraction of world population can afford to pay for tuition fees at these universities you have all made it uh, in a way that you you are receiving a fully funded scholarship and that's something that a lot of our uh, audience uh, is really really interested in so the first thing that came to my mind when i'm looking from a china perspective where mostly students apply for, for, for private funding, their parents are going to pay for that. They don't even think that it's possible to get a fully funded scholarship. They, my students here who are also brilliant and smart, they kind of think like, oh, like there's even no way. And uh, then when I, was, when I was talking with students here, they say like, well, they know that a lot of Chinese parents are very rich and they know that education in China is at a, at a very high level. So they're, they're going to tell me that I'm not that good. And that led me to, to see something which is a kind of a paradox that the more difficult the environment is, uh, your merits and uh, the, the, your achievements are going to be kind of, you're, it's going to be your advantage coming from a, a disadvantaged background. Uh, can somebody shed some more light here? Nicola, can we start with you? Yeah, I mean, it's, a ver it's very important to know that some universities offer financial aid uh, based on your need. So if, if you need uh, some amount of money to, to study there, they will give you as much as you need. So yeah, I mean, it's very important to, 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 to research uh, the, the universities you're interested in and just prioritize these universities. All 
I was just writing a list of colleges who are need blind, which basically means um, that these are places that won't even look at how much money you have until you are accepted. Um, so they don't care. Um, as long as you are someone they want on the, on their campus, um, you're going to be accepted regardless of whether you can pay for it or not, because they have enough money to pay for your tuition regardless of um, you know your, your status there. So um, these are uh, colleges where really it will literally only matter about what your application is like and not about how much money you have, which is a great ad advantage to um, our students, Bosnian students, or you know, regional students who whose parents just don't make that much money. Um, and just to put it in perspective, a year um, at my college costs, you know, including living expenses and everything, um, and even you know, like some pocket money, it costs up to like ninety to a hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, so really, like this is something that's unimaginable to our students, and like it was unimaginable to me. But um, I don't like my parents don't have to send me money at all. I make enough on my own and I get enough in scholarship on my own where I'm not gonna have debt when I graduate um, and I won't have to be like paying things off until, you know, until I die. Um, but um, it's really these like several, I think it's like six now universities who do that. Um, the others will kind of put factor that into your application. So they might notice that you didn't have enough funds to like do certain things. And depending on like how they judged your application, this might be helpful or not. Um, so be careful about like, I think like take the opportunity to apply to all of these that are need blind because that in that case, like you just have a much, much higher chance. Um, yeah, I like I applied to all five of them at the time and I got into four and was waitlisted at one of them because it just happened that way um, where my application was like good enough to um, to get in on, on its own, like without without the financial need-based thing. Um, also, I think it's important to note that um, a lot of these top schools do not offer merit scholarships. They assume like all of you are good on merit-based, so we're just going to offer need-based. So it's important to research that beforehand. And also, if you're looking for scholarships, look into like, are they only for citizens or can international supply as well? How much money uh, they offer? like what percentage of tuition that would cover um, and just like other people's experiences because um, if you get in and you do not get enough like money from them it's practically impossible unless as Hannah said you won't be in debt till you die and your grandkids and other other. Muni but do you have anything to add here um, getting a road oh, scholarship or just... something? something huge so like can you share some some of your experiences i was just typing in the chat so i went to nyu and a particular college uh, satellite campus called nyu in abu dhabi and so they are also need blind and actually they prefer students um, they're really passionate about getting students from disadvantaged backgrounds so that is really good for people applying from our region but I think for the Rhodes Scholarship, you have to, it's a graduate scholarship. So you apply for it after you finish undergraduate. And Bosnians and Croatians and Serbians are not eligible, but now there is a global scholarship scheme for which you can apply to, even though it's only two positions, two places, but please do apply. Um, but there are a lot of graduate scholarships, the Fulbright, um, the Chevening, um, the, the Schwartzman, I think now in China, um, there's really a lot of them. And I think the difference for the graduate one is when you apply for the graduate one, you're really an employee oftentimes, especially if you're a PhD student. So they will pay for you to come because it's you will be working for them in a, in a way. Um, whereas for an undergraduate, you're really just a student. And I feel like if you apply to the top 25 schools in the US, they will find, once you get in, they will find a way to fund you. They will find some miracle secret department scholarship that will give you money. Yes, don't, don't worry about that when you apply, I think. That that's a great tip. I, I really think that's something that our, our audience can be encouraged by. Basically, there will be a way if you find a way to stand out. So it's, it's something about how much did you use your opportunities. And obviously, studying without scholarship here would be almost a mission impossible. That moves us to the next part of the discussion, which is experience with living abroad. So you guys have made it. You got a full scholarship. You got your visa and plane tickets and you're ready to rock and roll. 
but then obviously moving abroad anywhere carries a lot of uh, challenges with it. So what are the, some of the largest obstacles for you? Maybe start this question with Hannah. Right. So I, I mean, I felt very safe coming in because I had this um, financial aid that basically covered all of my costs. Plus, like it, it gave me a stipend to like start off with. It was called like the startup grant, which uh, in which they like gave me an extra two thousand dollars to just spend on like first year things that you need. So like a computer, um, any kind of like supplies, bedding for your bed because you don't you don't get a pillow when, when you when you move in, but you do get a room. Um, and for me, housing was um, guaranteed for all four years. So I, I had guaranteed like on college housing, like in college housing. Um, so really, I like I didn't feel um, as scared of like what I will do coming in. But then I started like walking around like I wanted to go out for ice cream with my friends. And like it, it, it just kind of surprised me and my parents a lot that the like for three of us, like the entire bill was like over $20 just to have a single scoop of ice cream. And you can't really have like a meal for under $12. Um, and so it, it really like once I started to go out of my campus and out of the all of the things that are free for me, you kind of notice that, that the standards are way, way different. Um, and if you're being funded from home, this might impact your life a lot more. So I started doing on-campus jobs and like all of these things to like kind of compensate for my weekly expenses that weren't, you know, dining hall food that was free for me and my living expenses that were also free for me. Um, so if, if, you know, if you want to have anything other than that, you kind of have to take into account the fact that it's much, much more expensive to live here um, than it is in Bosnia in any case that you can think of. So um, right now I'm off campus. So I have to pay for rent. I have to pay for utilities. I have to pay for all of these things. And like, again, I, my scholarship kind of covers everything. But if it doesn't, like if your case is that it doesn't, you have to kind of research all of the costs before you come so that you're not like so, as surprised and slapped in the face as, as I was. And I think it's uh, varying across schools. And for my undergraduate, they really took care of everything. They gave us bedding. They, they just took care of it. You don't pay utilities. You don't do any of that. But um, it does vary. And I think regarding on-campus jobs, I really think they're such a great thing. One, one, they enable you to get closer to the community by actively engaging in it and being a part of it. Secondly, when you want to do something after you graduate, it's part of your resume it's part of your experience you can write about in your personal statement and third you also get money they're usually like minimum wage jobs but that is still better than zero as long as you can balance it with your workload which a lot of students do most of my friends did on campus jobs during their four years yeah um yeah i think on campus jobs are also a great way to like um enrich in your like uh, academic experience as you move forward with your school uh, you're more likely to get like higher paid jobs especially if you started in something like tutoring or like uh, assistant in teaching so and those jobs while not being that like physically demanding are also great on resume and just make you like real and stuff because of course we are humans and if we do not repeat something after a while that knowledge might kind of like die out but if you are assisting in something like teaching assistant, you have to always be alert and answer to, ready to answer the questions. Exactly. And also they pay great. <laughs> yes, that's what I realized. The best way, the best way to learn is to teach. And uh, I'm sure that many, uh, from my knowledge, many universities utilize that option. Almost all gifted students are encouraged to assist and support professors and to kind of be involved in teaching from, from early days. But what about, uh, for me, obviously moving to China was a huge culture shock, but even probably moving to, to, to culture which seems familiar to you from movies, from music, can still carry some of, some of its own burden. Can you share some, some uh, examples where maybe you did an inappropriate joke or used inappropriate language I would, I'm sure our audience would love to hear about that. Munib, did you have any of these experiences? I remember now, uh, but it is true. Bosnia is a relatively conservative society and the US is not, depending on where you go in colleges, but usually they're in um, neoliberal kind of communities. Um, 
so it is true that you, I think you have to be careful. Racial jokes are usually never a good thing. Um, jokes based on religion, not even comments are not welcome. Please don't do that. Um, and but you get used to it. The atmosphere kind of lets you know what what is allowed to not allowed to, but encouraged to have fun about and what's absolutely not OK. Um, and I feel like it's not that big of a deal. I went to the UAE, so United Arab Emirates for undergraduate, even though I went to study away in the US. Um, so that was also a very different cultural experience, but um, you will spend a lot of your time on campus with students. And that is a separate kind of environment from where, wherever you're placed. So that I feel like is the biggest factor that determines your experience. And then you will go out and experience the city or the country. Yeah, we kind of pride ourselves on. Oh, do you want to go ahead? You can go. Okay. Yeah, we, like as as a nation, we kind of pride ourselves on being like so multicultural and everything. But I don't think like anyone realizes that like it's really not that multicultural. We kind of still share a culture. Once you show up at a campus with like I don't know six thousand students and like three thousand of them are like very way 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 different in personality from you, you have to. Um, take in all of their cultures as you would want someone to take in yours um, and, you know, just be quiet and I, I'd not be quiet, but like listen for a little while before you kind of dare to speak out so vocally about, about any opinions of, of their own like experience um, in life. So definitely like comment on yours, say whatever you want. Um, but as when you said, some things are good and some things are not so good to mention. So kind of reserve those comments until you understand fully what kind of environment you're in. Um, also, I wanted to share an anecdote about like different cultural thing that like regarding rate sharing. So I was used that like after you do uh, like a exam in Bosnia, they probably like tape the results on the like door of the university and everyone can see. And after I had my first midterm in college, I was walking back with um, some students from my class and we got like results and I was like, how did you do? And they were like, fine. I'm like, okay, what's well, fine? Like, give me a number. And they're like, no, we, we don't talk about that. So that was kind of like something to get used to. You only know your own grade and you get the like median grade of the class, but just asking someone from for like their specific letter grade or numbers is very like rude and inappropriate. that's something that i have experienced in my teaching career here students don't like that their grades are publicly uh, given to entire class which was very shocking for me uh, what about um, there's obviously plenty of plenty of uh, challenges and possible obstacles how did you get used to food to climate uh, we all as, as as hannah said we all share quite a similar climate and uh, quite a similar food taste and these are some things that are quite important you are going to be eating a couple of times a day uh, climate can affect you a lot do you have anything to share here Ivana? what do you think i think food wise i'm not like really picky person so i was not um big change also our dining halls are like really great and offer a variety of food they don't exactly have balkan food but they have a lot of like middle eastern food which is kind of similar and it's kind of more healthy than paradoxically more healthy because there's like less meat and more vegetables which is good for your organism and um when it comes to climate i was like yeah it's gonna be cold they told me i know i've had snow i've seen snow i'm not unprepared but first winter there was like it would go to like minus 30 celsius and none of the classes would be canceled and professor was just like yeah this is normal and we had this thing called winter carnival when they like it's like a whole uh, cyclist of like winter activities. It's a very big thing at Dartmouth. And there was this part when they like drill a hole in the pond and make every like who, of course they won't force you, but it's tradition to like go and jump in the frozen pond. And I was like, oh my God, I'm never gonna do that. And then next year you're like, hmm, I wanna apply. I wanna do that, I wanna flex with that. So I think uh, it's also a matter of fact to get used to be prepared if you're going to like cold climate to have appropriate winter gear and probably like gosh between prices whether you should buy it uh, overseas or in bosnia or like is, is it available in bosnia and just make sure to take care of yourself and your health because um 
that's the most important thing for your like academic performance as if you get sick you're probably fall behind and it's very hard to catch up especially in such fast-paced environment and especially if you're a freshman and do not know the resources that well yet and yeah it's my third winter here now and it's first winter when i did not get sick so i guess you can adjust <laughs> Aren't you the food? Just a quick comment. Um, vegetables are great. They show up a lot, but if you're eating like non-vegetable things, they're going to be very sweet and filled with like sugars that we are like in Europe not familiar with. So I ate the same way I ate at home, like and at home I never gained weight. Um, and I started like eating pasta and all of the things that were offered in the dining hall and noticed that they were like fundamentally different in ingredients. So be careful about that because they might taste the same but they're like not actually the same and they might affect your body in different ways yeah fair point fair point uh, you have already mentioned uh, during this discussion that there are possibilities for on-campus part-time jobs to support yourself and you have mentioned some great uh, tips about uh, how to budget and so on and uh, i feel that's something that many young people all over the world are missing just missing the basic i missed a basic economic knowledge how to maintain my own finances so thank you very much for sharing uh, all these experiences um the reason why nicola is not participating in this part of the discussion is because unfortunately covid pandemic has forced nicola not forced nicola made a choice but he's still home in metkovic in croatia because uh, you got an option to skip a year or wait for wait for a bit before joining can you share a bit more here yeah so basically with with covid uh they decided to to give us two options uh take a gap year and stay at home or study from home and yeah i mean to me it was better to take a gap year and i'm not sure how how this will change into the into the next year I'm not sure if, if classes will start normally, but I think things are looking optimistic for the US. Yes, again, pandemic has been has been changing education in in, in incredible ways, incredible to think about a couple of months ago. So uh, I'm sure I, in a, during a social network um, crowdsourcing of these questions a lot of a lot of our uh, audience was really interested in to know like how are you affected now were you able to make it home are you trapped uh, a lot of these uh, scholarships and a lot of application processes have also been uh, adjusting to to covid measures what are what are your experiences uh Munibe, you're now in travnik probably not your first choice to be today or you really enjoyed home um so first I wanted, oh, what was you? Oh, never mind. Yes, I am at home. Uh, but um, so Oxford has three terms during the year and I did the first term there. Uh, and then they decided to do lockdown and I decided that there is no point being there stuck in a room if everything is remote. So I decided to continue the other two terms uh, from here from home because that way I save money. And I'll be at Oxford for three more years. So. I'll have enough time to spend that money in person. Uh, so that was my calculation. Um, but I definitely think Nico made the right choice by deciding to move his freshman year. I think freshman year at Harvard, I've heard is very particular, especially because of the graduate house, the housing lottery and all of that stuff and the clubs. So I think really that made sense. Um, but you also asked another question that I forgot, but I had an answer to. Um, if you wouldn't mind to repeat, Gora probably it was it was in a way that your experience changed during the pandemic uh, are you now forced to stay in travnik would you be would you be in oxford if you're allowed or yeah so basically i can go to the uk now i just decided to stay here as i said but i want to touch upon a question that was in the chat that asked oh if you are a college and that might not be related but i just want to answer it if you're a college student um already in Bosnia, can you apply to colleges in the US? Yes, you can. As long as you haven't graduated from a, from a college, you can apply. Um, and the same rules apply. As for transfers, I think it's harder. You, usually you have to transfer between US schools and it's harder to transfer from abroad. Yeah. 
COVID life, Hannah? Um, <laughs> I, I've, I had a very particular story that's very long for, for um, this conversation, but um, I decided to stay in New Haven um, where Yale is. Uh, I moved off campus. So even though I had guaranteed housing on campus, it was so kind of shaky and like they kept moving us between rooms because um, actually Pfizer's um, clinical studies are done in my town. So um, really a lot was going on in like first responders and everything. So it was kind of safer for me to just pick an apartment off campus and kind of have my university pay for that apartment where I don't have to move around. Um, so I stayed um, for like the second half of our spring semester when the lockdown happened. I stayed for the summer. Um, I was doing summer classes as well because I was just bored. Um, and then I also like I'm still here. I, I did go um, home for about a month um, during last fall semester because we had this like break and we, you know, everything went even more remote. So I had a chance to like attend the last week of classes from home. But um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm still here. It's, it's just easier. I don't know, internet connection at home is not the best and it like the time zone difference wouldn't be as, as good. So um, I, said, I, I decided to like not take a year off because it was weird to do that like halfway through my college career. I think like, like, like Monique said, like Nicola's choice was great, um, but it was not the right time for me, so. Yeah, same for me. I'm still in Hanover um, at Dartmouth campus. I was kind of tied to be here with my on-campus jobs and some of my classes are still um, have some in-person components. Uh, I also, I was stuck here during the summer because the college situation was not so great and I was not um, ready to travel. And I also had like free housing and everything from college. It was like, why not use this and enjoy the college? internet speed. Um, I had to travel to Bosnia to renew my visa, which was additional complication because we get it on only two years. But everything worked well and now I'm back here and I'll probably be here for a while. Okay, thank you for sharing. I think this is very, very interesting. Uh, everybody has a different experience. Uh, the next part after talking for like after landing and and being there you obviously had to quickly adjust to quite a different uh academic requirements probably quite a different style of uh, teaching and learning uh i have noticed huge differences between uh, asia and europe uh, i'm sure uh, us and uk are a bit similar but still uh, there has been a lot of obstacles for you there i'm sure and i would like to hear and our audience would like to hear how did you cope with that? Hannah, what are your thoughts on this? Just on my education or education in general? I think it's like, that's a different question. Well, you can, you can start with general, like what, what, was, what, was your, what were your first thoughts? But then obviously, if it's something specific for you, I'm sure anything will be helpful for our audience. Yeah, so switching to um, COVID really kind of switched us into a, a situation where I felt like I was still studying in Bosnia because I was like living on my own, cooking for myself, doing all of these things. And then there was like the classes I had to attend. Um, but I don't like the format of studying didn't change too much. Um, they, they were very helpful. Um, my university um, at in the like w when everything happened, when the lockdown happened, a lot of people were going through a lot of like personal troubles, like getting home and all of these things. So they um, they basically gave us a university like pass fail program which m means if you pass the class you don't get a grade it doesn't matter what grade you get as long as you like passed it it just says on your transcript like you passed the class and that's great um and then basically it was just decided that all of um all, all of the professors were just like we're gonna pass everyone like it's so mean to like fail someone at this point in in, in a year like that um so that was my, it made things a lot easier because I, I i had to move like three times before um before i settled down during the semester so i had to be in classes and also moving all of my things and it was like personally hard um but it made uh things a lot easier because some people waived exams so like one of my professors just said we're not even going to have a final exam like just do your homework and that's it um, some people waived homework and said we're only going to have an exam and all of these things. So, so really, every single class and every professor like treated things differently. But the general um, like idea was that 
we are going to accommodate students as much as we can and we're not going to like be sticking to this rigid structure as everything around us is like falling apart so um so they were definitely very accommodating for that um and but but like the general like class structure didn't feel as different like as different as i expected it to be we just did move to zoom and didn't have to like walk 15 minutes before like in between classes and like in in the snow and all of these things so it definitely did help there too Anybody has any points to add? Uh, I'm sure uh, our audience would be interested to hear what can I, uh, how can I look for help? Who's going to help me if I'm struggling with academic demands? For example, I know that one of the problems is that in, in education back home, we are basically only asked to develop one skill and that's to memorize as many things as possible while you often have to create knowledge and write and synthesize different things. So. How did you how did you adjust there, Ivana? Maybe you can yeah. tell us more. Yeah, I think office hours are like big part of U.S. education when you can go uh, like one on one with a professor and discuss. It doesn't have to be like class related, but you, you can get a lot of help for class if something's like not clear to you. They're, they're like they're not there to like make you feel dumb. They're usually like looking to help and they want their students to feel good and like get more knowledge. Other than that, you can also get a lot of like mentorship experience from a professor. And if it's class you're particularly interested in and you go to office hours, you can kind of navigate to get a professor, like to do research with them or like to give you a recommendation for a job. And these connections are gonna really matter in your like post-grad career. Um, other resources for help, at least at Dartmouth are like teaching assistant hours. Um, now like holding help sessions for some of the engineering classes I did well in. So um, you can come there and like either discuss like some concepts you didn't know, know and they can like guide you through that. Um, you can also request one-on-one -on -one tutor that's free, which is a um, good thing because some students actually have paid tutors, which was like weird for me because like, why would you pay if you like can do it yourself or something? But um, that's also a great resource and you should not be definitely not ashamed to ask for help because it's definitely easier and better to ask for help than to fall behind because no one's gonna wait for you in such like fast paced and competitive setting. And also there are different ways to like, especially during COVID, there's different ways to organize and have like study groups because we all know that like our attention spans are kind of damaged by Zoom fatigue and that we have to like have some sense of accountability while studying yeah um let me know if i missed something no i think that's 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 a great answer uh you mentioned that it, and a lot of you mentioned on many occasions it's very challenging it's very competitive it's very fast-paced and i'm sure you had to i'm sure it's a struggle to balance between all the social aspects and private life and academic obligations and I think it's important to maybe talk to our audience what kind of systems you have to have in place. Like I won't even go into research that says that that correlates healthy lifestyle and and good habits in sleeping, dieting, exercise with future life and academic successes. Can you share your stories of success? What are your foundations? Maybe some study habits, maybe dietary habits. This is something where you can take your time to answer. And I would like each one of you to offer answer because uh, you can inspire somebody to try to do the same thing. Let's start with Nicola. Yeah, so uh, basically there are a ton of books on, on, on this stuff. I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to invent the wheel. I'm, uh, for example, you have Cal Newport. Cal Newport's books are, are, are excellent. He he has a bunch of books on how to how to study effectively, how to work effectively, how to how to uh, navigate your career effectively, and yeah, just read read all of his books basically. Uh, there's also there's also Barbara Oakley. Uh, she she made some very good books on learning and and study methods and how to how to effectively uh, learn new things. And she she also ha has it in a course uh, in a course called I think uh, I don't remember how exactly it's called but yeah 
a mind for numbers is, is her book. So yeah, Barbara Oakley, Cal Newport, and just find a bunch of books on productivity. Yeah. I think for me, uh, the biggest difference uh, I noticed between me and the other people in my cohort in my class was there's a big culture on uh, studying for the exam two or one day before and then just doing something called all-nighters, like investing 20 hours studying for something. Meanwhile, I break it up. So in a week, if we cover certain lectures, certain material, I will study that material that week and then make notes and then review them. So when you break it up, it's very manageable. Your life is an ordered paradise. But if you decide to move it on, oh, the exam is in like three months. I'll just study this class then. It really piles up and you will not sleep in the last two, three days. So please don't do that. Um, going off that, I think it's important to like stay on top of your classes and to pay attention in lectures. Uh, a lot of U.S. colleges have like weekly homeworks that kind of force you to like relearn the material, which is kind of um, minimizes the time needed for like final exam because it's not like you're going to relearn that material like that not, that the day before, but you kind of just refresh yourself on things you already studied. I think uh, what helped me because I ha have a lot of like extracurriculars. I do triathlon and I work several jobs and do research like good calendar to keep everything um, in one place is really essential and just make sure you get enough sleep and um, to get food because your body needs fuel and not, it's not going to work and so it's going to reflect on your like performance in school and you don't want that. Yeah, that leads us to, to, to mental health, which... Uh moving abroad to, to as an international teacher i was shocked how how little i have heard during my education and i hope that this is changing all over the world and eventually we are all going to reach low points in our life where demands of our outside world and stress are going to really bring us maybe in a place that we don't want to be how to deal with this when you're a student? How to deal with this when you are in the middle of maybe exams and when it's really demanding? Are there some, are, is there any support that can help you? Hannah, do you know anything more? Yeah, so um, mental health is like a really big topic um, at, at these like liberal arts colleges and like places that kind of offer you a lot of resources for these things. So it's it's very like stigmatized in our, in our region um, and it's not something that people consider. It's almost like, you know, like, settle down, push through it, like you'll, you'll be fine, you can do it on your own. Um, I think it's really, really important to know that you can't or don't have to do it alone over here. Um, and so kind of pay attention to, to what your capabilities are and like push yourself just enough, but don't push yourself too hard to the point where like you're kind of hopeless. Um, a lot, a lot, and like if, ne if not every of these universities have um, extensive resources for mental health care um, and it's something that you need to be attuned to with yourself so you, you I can't you know put a blanket statement that like everyone has this experience or that experience like you need to notice um, if you're doing okay like with yourself and, and, and kind of living your own life and if not um, you, there are definitely resources to like find help for that so you can find counselors you can have um, your deans help you like academically your professors are very um, accommodating for this too so you can ask for extensions on things if you um, you know, run into some trouble completing things on time. Um, and really it's it's something that, you know, definitely becomes a big part of your life and people are much freer to talk about it. Um, so it's, it's something that, you know, sometimes you just have to say like, I'm not I, like, I don't wanna be doing this thing this week. So um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a lot more normalized and it's something that you should honestly normalize for yourself, even if you're not coming to the States for, for education because it is the most important thing and like the thing that drives your knowledge and if you are ignoring it and if you're like forcing yourself to think that you can push through it you might run into some obstacles that are like not as easy to go through yeah i think also mental health is just like ongoing process and um you kind of have to find things that work for you and not be afraid of like trying either counseling or like there are different like student run wellness groups that are promoting certain techniques and maybe if something works for someone else doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for you you kind of have to adjust to your own body and mindset and on the topic of extensions i had um 
I had a professor that said a really cool thing. He was like, I don't care if you like submit it exactly on time. I want you to do your best, which I think is really a uh, good sentiment. And I think the biggest impact I've noticed to mental health and uh, students getting depressed when they come to college is expectations. So usually if you're in these top schools, you were the number one student in your class, but now you're surrounded with people that are either smart or smarter than you. And sometimes I feel like people can't handle those expectations or different performances. So I think you should think about that before you get there. Once you get accepted, start preparing yourself for being fine with not being the top person in your class. That's fine. Also, I think a lot of us often get like scared by the amount of people that are in class that had like access to all of these top resources, rich parents that could send them like to private schools from age of three and could like offer to pay for their like, like some competitions or like extra classes. And we often like feel inferior, but we have to have in mind that like we're not starting from this like same position and we can't really compare ourselves and just the thing that we're at the same place now tells a lot about our capabilities. Yeah, and that's a, that's a great point. Yeah, Nicola, please continue. Um, although I don't have much uh, experience in, in uh, being in college, I think that one widely held misconception is that you have to choose between health and academic success. And I think that most people just it's not a choice between health and academic success. You have to be healthy in order to succeed academically. There's, there's no way that you could, that you could uh, uh, c consistently uh, overwork yourself without burning out. So your health always has, has to be number one priority. Um, I'm kind of... As, as a teacher, I'm so inspired by, by your maturity and by your takes, and I really feel that this is a, an override, overarching subject or a foundation. Like You can't learn anything if you're not feeling good. You can't be able to perform your best if you are not feeling at your best. So I feel these are really powerful takes for, for our audience, and I thank you very much for that. Um, the last... Um, kind of a question is also something that I think our audience is going to love to hear. Um, right now, studying at the world's best universities kind of allows you to, to have dreams that maybe otherwise would be impossible if you had stayed in Bosnia and Croatia, if you hadn't taken that leap of faith that we spent these last hour and 20 minutes talking about. What are your dreams? What are your plans? And take your time. Um, have a story for our for our students to, to, to share with us what do, what can you become what do you think you can become let's start with Hannah maybe sure um so there are two perspectives to this you can be um very ambitious to like become like a CEO of like some some kind of company or work in this like huge company that you never could could imagine to work at so like I most of my classmates end up working for Facebook Google Microsoft all of these like big places and it's actually kind of normal to get internships at these places so um it definitely changes your perspective as to like what's possible and what's you know unlikely um but there's also the perspective that um there's a lot of pr like given these situations there's a lot of pressure to like want to be those things and, and, and kind of want to get them. Um, with me, it's the case that like, I realized I don't. Um, but the thing is like, you, you get this perspective of like, I can move wherever I want in the world and I will have an opportunity to find a job, whatever that job might be. Um, and you know, the only obstacle really becomes like the paperwork you have to do in Bosnia, Croatia or wherever. Um, and it's not so much, you know, like I can't get a job because I'm not good enough or I can't like, you know, move here because I like don't know this or whatever. Um, you really are prepared to be a world citizen in that sense. Um, and everything kind of becomes an open like gate, you, you know, like for me, it was, it, it's no more like if I ever moved to, for example, China, it's more like, oh, like if I wanted to, I could do that. And then like, these would be the logistics of doing that. Um, so really, it depends on what your goals are. I think it's very important to like not um, it, it, at these places, like 95% of these students are extremely wealthy. And by extremely wealthy, I mean, like you cannot imagine the amount of money they have. Um, and, you know, their, their resources are different. They have connections at places that are very powerful and all of these things. And like you have to kind of internalize the fact that you are not 
you know, coming from the same background, not, you're, you're not in the same position as them. So if, even if you don't get these opportunities, it's like not your fault. Um, but you can definitely find something that makes you happy. And I think that should be the goal. Like you are able to and should pursue things that make you happy. And they're going, like, you're still going to be fine. You're going to have a degree from like a big place. And, you know, you're, you're not going to be unemployed for a very long time. You're only going to be unemployed if you want to be. I don't know. I don't know if I have dreams, honestly. Like I'm a junior now and I'm like kind of, what's happening? I don't want to graduate, um, but yeah. Yeah, um, I agree with the sentiment of like, no wanting to leave school. I'm really happy here. It's probably the happiest I've been like in my life so far. And you kind of get attached to like your college and the college life and the whole culture around it. When it comes to my post-graduation plans, they honestly change with every new class I take. I'm just like, get so obsessed with it. And I'm like, oh, maybe I want to do this. Maybe I want to do that. So right now I'm like looking for um, probably some internship in the renewable energy industry or like um, cars and just like the intersection of like engineering and sustainability is what interests me the most right now. But I've like done multiple things like research with the professors and you don't really know if you like something like to the like details until you try. So I think that's a um, good mindset you have to not have like to new, not be married to like post graduation plan to just allow yourself to explore and find what works for you and what won't make you miserable because I feel like at least for me even if job is like good paying and I don't feel good about it and I'm not happy I don't think it's worth it especially like with the U.S. system um I think it's important to prioritize like it's definitely going to be more paid than Bosnia so like just do something you like Oh yeah, on the career fairs, that's also a good opportunity, especially now most of them are virtual, so you can just hop on and like talk to different employers. And um, there are also a lot of career resources at colleges that like help you edit your resume, connect you to alumni that work in like similar fields and uh, also like bring different companies to campuses and do recruiting. I think for me, like Ivana said, like it changes when I, was a freshman and when I applied I wanted to do solar energy and intersection between mechanical engineering and electrochemistry and that really changed so by my senior year I, I was doing AI in healthcare and uh, for my thesis I developed a wearable to predict and detect heart attack so and that is kind of what I do now except more biology but it really changes through time and where I see myself is in industry more than academia. And it's not true if you do PhD, you have to go into academia. You can still go to very interesting jobs in industry. Um, yeah, and that usually that is actually where I see myself working on health technology in Google Health or DeepMind or places like that, yeah. Yeah, and for me, uh, I, I currently have no idea what I want to do. Uh, but I don't think that you really need to have an idea. Uh, all I know is that I want, to, I want to kind of help improve the world in some way, but in what way, I have no idea. And when I was applying, I, I had a kind of gambler's mindset. I thought, how much, what is the expected value? What's the, what's the probability of me actually getting into the university? And how much do I need to, to pay to, to kind of... Uh, to buy a lottery ticket in a way and i calculated that it was the best lottery i would ever ever play the, the payoff was 200 times the 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 initial investment so yeah i mean you you don't need to have the answers right now you, you can figure it out as you go and it, it's it's true in the past for me too i mean if i ever tried to predict even one year in advance what i was doing with my life i would be wrong every time Those are, those are really all great points. And I think they can be summarized that studying at, at this level just gives you a great self-confidence that you can make it anywhere in the world, that you can be flexible and just enjoy the process. And that's, that's so precious. We have reached the end of this part. And for conclusion, for our main part of discussion, key takeaways in 30 seconds. Uh, one of the questions that... Have, uh, 
kind of like really buzzed in my ear is one of our students asked, what are some of the things that high schoolers can do right now to increase our chances at getting accepted to these universities? So maybe that can be our guide as short as possible, give advice, and we are going to move on to Q&A session, session later. Maybe we can start with Munib. So I would apply to as many schools as possible, have safety schools, which are the schools you're pretty like look more like to get into um don't be discouraged if you don't get in you can also apply next year um invest as much into the application itself as possible don't worry about oh how will i deal with living there how will i um i don't know do there academically you can figure that out later once you get in yes but apply to as many places as possible and invest in the application itself nicola um, my best advice would be to, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. The, the, for almost everything you do in life, there have been people who have already done it. So read books, use the internet, ask questions. Uh, people will always give you advice and you don't have to repeat other people's mistakes. That's a great point. Ivana? Yeah, it kind of was similar like Munib and Nicola, just uh, try to apply as many schools as possible. Don't be afraid to ask questions. There are so many resources of like Bosnian students living abroad are willing to help you. We like to see people from our country succeed and we like to help doing that. So we would ourselves be a great resource and also be very authentic on your application and just try to present yourself in the best light possible and good luck. Yeah, and um, yeah, and a general kind of piece of advice is just don't um, waste time thinking that someone is going to help you do this. Um, in a sense of like you have to do everything on your own, so you need to be proactive and really like. There might be people who will like try to guide you through it, but ultimately it's your choice like to do some things or to not do some things. So, you know, if you have a moment of your time, don't like doom scroll through like, I don't know, Facebook or Instagram, like go research a university that you're interested in and see what their application process is and all of these things that you can like do in your free time to just kind of get more familiar, familiarized with um, with the process. Because like this, this panel is like definitely not enough to cover everything. Definitely, but I think we, we really tried, we really tried our best to give as much as useful information in the shortest possible amount of time. Again, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina Futures Foundation, in my opinion, and not, 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 not a subjective opinion because I'm part of it, is really trying to make these things happen uh, for more and more students. And uh, we are going to be preparing uh, a, resource, a resource database, which is going to be in our YouTube description uh, after this session is over. Also, in a couple of days, as soon as I find some time, We'll make a post about this and we'll include all of these great ideas from our panelists tonight. I'm, I'm all over the moon for hearing everything here tonight. And this is not the end. We are moving on to Q&A session. Uh, for those of you who are listening to us, please follow uh, BHFF social networks to stay tuned. And um, right now we can start with any of the panelists choosing any question to answer in live. And again, uh, participants, please ask as much as possible in next 30 minutes. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I see one question from an, an anonymous attendee about uh, how, how much does participating in, in competitions like Olympiads and uh, it, making a computer science projects uh, impact your applications and definitely there is a huge impact uh olympiads are, are one of the one of the best ways to to prove your your competences and when it comes to cs uh projects there are some universities which which give you the option to submit a portfolio be it, be it an engineering portfolio or a cs portfolio and I, as far as i rem remember i think it's harvard mit Columbia, Stanford, maybe John Hopkins. And yeah, that, that portfolio is, is the best way to, to show them what, what you can do. So you, you submit a bunch of code, a bunch of, let's say, engineering projects, pictures uh, from 
like robotics projects, uh, blueprints, uh, yeah, explanations. So yeah, that's the best way to, to tell them. I mean, you don't have to, 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 to show them, oh, I have, my grades are 4.7 and I, I have, uh, I have th this on the ACT. It's, it's not just numbers. You are a person to them. They will look at your, your achievements from, from every perspective. And definitely whoever has that question, uh, send me an email and I, I can tell you more about those portfolios. Um, I can also add that like having a medal does not guarantee you'll like get in. And also not having a medal is not like a big obstacle because um, I think even if you do not have like, for example, CS, a lot of CS experiences, if you show it as you're like trying to learn as much as possible and just like frame that well in the essay, I think it's possible to get in as like CS department. I know some people that are like CS department, dark mid, who haven't like coded before and they're like doing great projects now. So definitely do not be discouraged or do not like be too excited if you have like some medals, but you do not have like the story to that tie all of that in. For the European graduate school admissions, reaching out to professors, I would say um, introduce yourself in the email, write about why you're interested in that professor's research, and then say, oh, would you be interested in having a conversation or would you be interested in supervising my project or whatever? And then send the email and a week later, send a follow-up. And then even if after the follow-up, they don't reply, then move on. I would say just, uh, oh yeah, I think you're typing the answer. Yeah, um, yeah. so just move on. There's a lot of professors in Europe. Um, what's it like applying to Oxford and other UK colleges? Um, for undergraduate, UK is very different to the US and they have a different system called UCAS, where, whereas there's Common App in the US. You cannot apply to Oxford and Cambridge in the same year, so you have to choose between the two. And for some, um, they don't have standardized testing, but if you're applying to particular degrees like mathematics at Oxford, so there you have to apply for a particular degree. There's no such thing as picking your major later. Um, you will have to do entry exams. So for math, you would do a math exam. For CS, you would do a math and CS exam, et cetera. So it's a lot more similar to, I would say, Bosnian education system. And undergraduate is usually three years at, in the UK. Um, if you're applying as a graduate student, it's very similar to the US. Um, you reach out to professors first and then see if they will fund your PhD. Um, and scholarships for PhDs. Yes, um, as, a, as some, we mentioned earlier, PhDs are usually paid jobs. So there's no scholarships per se. Like once you get a PhD, they will fund you to go. But there are also something called studentships, which is once you're a PhD student, you can apply to get even more money um, and fellowships and uh, all those kinds of schemes where people will fund your projects and fund your PhD even more. And those are not usually necessary to do a PhD. I think another important thing to mention about PhDs, I, I think I said it in the chat, but just in case people didn't notice, you don't have to have a master's to apply to a US um, PhD program. So a lot of them, a, a lot of people who start their PhD degree, um, they go straight out of their bachelor's studies program. So you don't um, need a particular kind of background as you do in Europe. So take that in, into account as well. Like if you, if you know you wanna be a doctor of some kind of thing, um, try it out. Um, so some applications are you know, more expensive and all of that, but um, if you get an opportunity to do a PhD in the States, for example, you will basically be set for the entirety of your PhD. Like Muneeb said, like you will be paid for being there. Um, but master's studies are not the same. Master's studies like actually have way, way fewer scholarships and are way harder, harder to get into. So usually universities of this size don't even have that many master's students because mostly they'll just go into PhD and like get a master's on the way as part of their PhD program. But um, yeah, if you're thinking about getting a master's in, in the States like that is a more complicated process where you might not get as many like need-based scholarships. So you might have to look for other venues. And also just to add on, in the UK, you cannot do that. Usually you have to get a master's and then you go on to do a DPhil, which is their version of the PhD. But it is much shorter than in the US where it's five, six years on a PhD. In the UK, it's three years. Yeah. Um, 
I'll speak on like comparison to friends um, who stay in Bosnia. I'll just say I have like very limited experience because I've talked to a couple of people from my high school that just like went to electrical engineering school or like uh, math studies. I think what the biggest difference is just like the relationship with professors, which seems very like, yeah, very bad in Bosnia that like students are often mistreated and they're like professors are not helpful not showing to like exams to office hours they're, they're not like trying to help you succeed which is i think very big difference another is like work-life balance uh and just like spending a lot of time in the university and not doing anything else and um not having a lot of hands-on experience um like or not having time to work part-time jobs and i think um like our body and education is a little bit more focused on like theoretical aspects and really trying to be like rigorous in like following the book, which is, I don't think that's the best way to like, if you wanna like get a job in the industry, I don't think that's the, the way you learn the most. I think the way you learn most, if you like work with stuff, if you like try things out, if you do labs research and just like internships, but I think um, based on the work that foundation has been doing, I see some people like working on internships, which is really positive. Yeah, one thing that surprised me a lot um, was the length of our lectures um, and our seminars. So um, some of my friends will mention that they have like seven hour long lectures in one day in, of like just one class. That does not happen with us. We have. Um, at most two hours and those two hours are excruciating if you have a lecture that's two hours long. Um, usually they're about 50 to 75 minutes um, and it's very structured and the professor will start on time and end on time even though like they're like, you know, they might stop mid sentence sometimes. Um, and also I haven't had a professor cancel a class maybe like more than three times in my in my three years here um and they show up all the time so that's something that was i was very surprised by hearing like even when i was in high school in in our universities in bosnia where you know sometimes like adjunct professors or like assistant professors will just not show up um and and you know either cl cancel class and then make up for it in those seven, seven hour long sessions that doesn't happen um and it's a much more like um structured system where everything is kind of like flowing easily because it's structured um and it's it's been such a great experience to have like resources like that and kind of be able to count on your professor being there and being helpful and being um as accommodating as possible so um yeah and another thing is that um i also mentioned that, like you can't retake exams here so um you basically get one shot at taking a midterm exam or a final exam um and it's kind of it's interesting because I know like back home people can just like sign up for a date where they want to take an exam um, and you know take it again and again and again and like you know just kind of repeat classes we don't get to do that um, our final exams are like a certain percentage of our final grade you may fail it you might pass it but it like adds on to your final grade and your final grade is what it is and if you want to repeat the class you have to do that again but you don't get a credit for it um, so really that's like something that's also very different and like something my friends didn't expect like whenever I was like so stressed about exams like they didn't understand why um, that's why um, but yeah it's it's a much more structured and like academic integrity is also a big thing. Um, people care a lot about um, how you take your exams, how you study, um, how individual you are, and like basically you have to do everything on your own. And um, any kind of like citation has to be cited. Um, you, you really can't like take anyone's work for anything um, and, and you have to be very original. So that's something I, I've seen ha has not been the case all the time in Bosnia. Yeah, honor code is a big part. I was teaching assistant for one class last term and we had to like report to the professor that student has like used outside resources in their homework and the student had to like choose to drop the class in order to not get expelled. So the like repercussions for not respecting the honor code are huge. And another difference I think like in regards to cultural is just that you won't like expect to go on uh, on a coffee with your like classmates because if you like go it's usually a study session and like if you hang out they're all gonna pull out their books and just like be in workaholic mode there is not really that bosnian easygoing culture like that's not a thing anymore uh there was a question Nicola, about the great take yeah sorry yeah. um about the standardized tests. 
So yeah, uh, in the US, the main standardized tests are the SAT and the ACT. And you have to choose to write either one of them. So basically see which one you like more. And they're, they're very similar tests. They're like some sort of general knowledge tests. So they test English, math, and science, basically. And yeah, uh, you have to take those uh, uh, from general, general knowledge. And there's also uh, specific subject tests uh, called the SAT subject tests. So then you can take a, an additional test, like in maybe biology or literature or physics or history. And also you have to, you, you probably will need to write an, an, an English test. So that could be the, the TOEFL or the Duolingo test or the IA, IELTS. Just research what the, the universities require. And also, if you need uh, extra info, I have a 20 minute video on this on YouTube. Just search Nikola Jurkovic. Yeah, Nicola's channel is one of the best. I've like the, probably only resource in our language I've found, and I wish it would existed when I was applying because it would save me a ton of time and headaches. So go check it out. Exactly. So that's Nicola's uh, YouTube channel and also his blog posts about the experience of studying in various countries are going to be a big part of our resource base and very helpful to you. Is this it? Do we have any more open questions? Uh, I can see Muni sponsored the scholarships. Do you recommend some fully funded master scholarships? Those are scholarships for PhD or? Um, they're masters. Oh, the, the ones I sent, yeah, they're masters. I think, yeah, they're all masters, except ATH Zurich has the excellence scholarship, but that one I think also covers PhD, but it also covers masters. Yeah, they're all master scholarships. Um, I think someone asked about UK scholarships A levels. I don't know about that. I because I, I didn't apply there for undergraduate and I didn't do A levels, so I'm not sure. Um, yeah, the UK like for undergraduate studies is much more skimpy on giving out scholarships based on financial need. So I ended up just not applying there. Um, so be considerate of like how much money you would be paying. I think that was like a big factor for me. Um, for example, like Oxford, Cambridge, like just straight up don't give scholarships based on need to, to Bosnian students. So like I would have had to make it to the top, top of the class at Oxford to be like able to get a merit scholarship, which is like, no, nope, <laughs> that's not gonna happen for me. So um, really just like look into what your universities are expecting and like don't make yourself go through A levels if like you're not planning on, on going there um, logistically. Uh, I can maybe give some more information here because um, my school is a British school and most of our students go to Oxbridge. And uh, I know that there are options to go with A-levels straight to uh, universities in US, but it kind of like depends and you have to do a thorough research there. Uh, some of my students are basically just transferring their A-levels grade and uh, applying to universities directly. And yes, I also completely agree that in terms of applying for scholarships, in any case, UK is kind of not the friendliest place, unless we talk about PhD. I have a lot of experience about, for example, teachers, my former colleagues who came up with uh, research ideas, and they're quite successful at getting research funding from UK, but only at a very kind of like advanced career stage. But I do know two Bosnian students at Oxford who are undergrads. One of them I suspect is paying because I suspect he is rich. But the other per guy, he went to UWC in Mostar. And I think they have this interesting thing where the UWC will pay for their sometimes, give them a scholarship after they graduate. So that's how he's funding it. And I think the Oxford helped them find some funding as well. Yeah, but I, I agree. Usually it's very difficult to find funding in the UK. I also think there is one person that like did a lot of math Olympiads and it's at Oxford now, but I'm not sure of details. We can definitely look after and if you have, or like try to get more community resources because we don't really know right now. 
yeah, I mean, in the UK, the, the scholarships have definitely gotten much more stringent uh, since, since Brexit. Now it's quite hard to, to find a scholarship. And there was a question about uh, how does having a perfect GPA in elementary and high school uh, help? And well, in my experience, it, it's not that important to have a perfect uh, like 5.0 GPA. I, I think that most universities will probably just look for a, like a 4.5 minimum. That's my experience. Hannah, have you seen a question about the competitive college club? Can you give a bit more information about that? I did not see the question, but I can just say that I applied in my junior year. I think I got in like over the summer between my sophomore and junior year. And basically it was just a weekly session of like talking about these applications and going through the process and kind of like training to like write these essays that are quite different from what we write in school. So um, it was it was a great way to like meet other students who were planning on applying as well. That's how I met Ivana. Um, yeah. And it's uh, it's also a good like pipeline to the Education USA Opportunity Fund, which pays for your applications. So um, you you have a higher chance of getting those if you're in the CCC. Um, yeah, look it up. Um, all of the Education USA centers and and um, the something corners. Uh, yeah, American corners. American corners. Yes, um, yeah. they, they all have um, resources for this, and you can just pick your regional one. I, I basically I zoomed in before zooming was cool into the Banyaluka um, sessions. <laughs> like I was the only one online there. Yeah, I think uh, during our time, it was a while ago. So for, forgive me if like I forget something, but we had some Fulbright scholars that were in Banyaluka. I think, and they were really helpful because they already like attended like IVs, so we could talk to them um, and just like they they provide a very I think they were probably the most useful feedback on our like essays. Also, and just a great also, resource to like get books and get all the stuff. But this reminded me that for Fulbright and Shevening, if so, US and UK for Bosnians, you have to come back once you finish your masters. In the US or UK. That's like a interesting caveat. And that's one of the few countries applied to one of which is Bosnia. That is truly interesting. Yeah. Uh, can anybody try to answer Mihailo's question? Anybody familiar if you start undergrad studies here due to pandemic, but really want to study abroad? Like anybody knows anything about transferring? I think that this is the question I tried to answer saying, like, oh, I had. I knew people in my university that did a year of college somewhere else and then applied and got in and continued from freshman year. Uh, transfers, I think, are harder to do if you're not at a U.S. school, transferring to a, not to a U.S. school. Um, yeah. Hannah, I think you yeah, wanted to add. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to like be, quickly say that it's very possible to like apply as long as you didn't already graduate and get a bachelor's. So like if you already have a bachelor's, none of the things that we just said apply to you and like you have to think about a different way like even the scholarships aren't, aren't going to be given to you if you have a degree already so if you started and you you're thinking about like starting again in, in a different country um, for the US I think most likely you would have to start over um, it's it's different for every college but you would have to basically like restart your college career and like go through all of this process that we are we like went through like immediately after high school and I think one thing to note is that our bachelor's programs are 99% of the time, four years long. So um, we don't have that like three plus one system or, or um, three plus two or four plus one or whatever it is um, to get a master's. Like you are not guaranteed a master's, um, like you're not guaranteed to get into your college for a master's degree once once you get an, once you get a bachelor's there. So you can go to college for like a couple of years in Bosnia or Croatia or wherever um, and then apply there, but you just kind of count on having to do four more years of that. we can spend some more time to wait for more questions and if maybe we don't have any in a minute or two we can finish a bit earlier so again those uh, 28 uh, participants still left here 
please use this opportunity to ask. Uh, also, yeah. we're available later. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I was I was going to add that uh, when it comes to preparations for the tests, uh, you you don't need to 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 spend a lot of money on on expensive courses or or prep. Uh, you you can you can prepare uh, entirely on the internet using free uh, sources. So don't don't get into a into a tourist trap just for college applicants. Though no, yeah. And don't go on college, college confidential. Like you might not know what that is now, but you will definitely find out. And once you do, don't go there. Um, uh, but I, I also wanted to say like, we're very available after this session to answer any questions or very available being on our student schedule. So like, you know, might not happen in the first hour once you send it, but um, yeah. Yeah, also in addition to college confidential, be very careful with like, applying to college subreddit because I know it sometimes would like made me really hopeless because people have to like sometimes have like a lot of rants about not getting in and just can be really frustrating. Yeah, that can be the, the last point for uh, tonight or today. Uh, we are going to share a screen with our contact information. So thank you again to all the panelists for expressing the availability for uh, follow-up. I'm also open to anybody who wishes to uh, ask anything related to what we have been talking about today. Again, guys, like thank you very much for your time, uh, especially during your busy schedules. For some of you, it's exam days, exam weeks. Uh, I really hope this is going to spark somebody to try to follow your steps and I hope that their, their path might be a bit easier because of the information you shared here with them tonight. Thank you again and thank you to BHFF and hope you hope that our audience had a great afternoon with us. Thank you again. Bye bye. Thank you. Good luck. Bye. Yeah.